Town Hall's community of curious and engaged Seattleites. Heck, folks from well beyond Seattle too. Like everyone who's willing to share or talk into their computers right now, some for the first time, I wanna thank Catherine and David for helping us keep the conversation aloft at Town Hall. Unfortunately, tonight's broadcast does not feature closed captioning services. However, captions will be available once this video is uploaded to our YouTube page, which we will do as soon as we can. Upcoming events include tonight's appearance by former Labor Secretary and noted economic explainer Robert Reich, Washington Post advice columnist R. Eric Thomas, Joe Serencioni on the future of U.S. nuclear policy, Dar Jamal bearing witness to the end of ICE, another installment of our Earshot Jazz Live at the Forum series this Saturday, as well as a few very exciting confirmations to be announced in the coming week. Uh, in fact, we're adding new programs every day, as well as new releases being, um, new events, I should say, being released as podcasts. And many of our past talks are available in video, video or podcast form on our digital media library. So in short, poke around the media tab on our homepage, and over the coming weeks, Town Hall will continue to provide not only ways to stay plugged in, but plenty more rabbit holes for you to climb down. As for tonight's event, Catherine will speak for about 20 to 25 minutes when she'll be joined by David, who will pose his own questions before moderating a Q&A with yours. He will select questions from those submitted in the Ask a Question field at the bottom center of your screen. You can enter yours there, and you can also vote on which questions our speakers answer first by clicking the arrow next to the question to upvote it. We cannot guarantee that our speakers will be able to answer every question, but we will try to get to as many as possible. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Arts and Culture at Town Hall is supported by Four Culture, Arts Fund, the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture, and the Wincote Foundation Northwest. But most important, Town Hall is a member-supported organization, and I want to thank all the members watching our program tonight. Meanwhile, everything you've heard is true. Town Hall and the nonprofit community at large are under significant strain right now, and we hope you will consider a gift during this difficult time by making a donation by clicking on the donate button at the bottom of your screen or becoming a member. You can make a donation online or text Town Hall to 44321 to give. Last thing, our partner booksellers have also been hit by the negative effects of the COVID outbreak, and they could use your support as well. If you're interested both in supporting a local independent bookstore and, of course, in having a copy of Catherine's book, we would urge you to purchase a book tonight using uh, on this live stream page, I should say, uh, uh, using the link through our friends at Third Place Books. All right, then. Catherine Stewart is an author and journalist whose work focuses on education and controversies over religious freedom and the separation of church and state. She began her career in journalism, working for the legendary investigative reporter Wayne Barrett of Village Voice, and has since contributed to Newsweek International, The New York Observer, and Rolling Stone, among other publications. In 2005, she published two novels about 21st century parenting um, before turning her attention to the constellation of issues around tonight's topic. On the matter of religion and society, she has written for The New York Times, The Nation, The Atlantic, and The Guardian, as well as authoring 2012's The Good News Club, which investigated religious fundamentalism in public education. She's joined tonight by the journalist and blogger David Nywert. Previously, he worked at MSNBC as a writer-producer, and over the last 20 years, he has focused on writing books and producing his blog, Orsinus, I hope that's correct, he'll correct me later, Orsinus. which re uh, reports on the far right's influence on mainstream society. He has served as an editor for the political blog, Crooks and Liars, and his book, And Hell Followed With Her, Crossing the Dark Side of the American Border, won the 2014 International Latino Book Award for Nonfiction. Stewart's book, The Power Worshippers, Inside the Dangerous Rise of Religious Nationalism, is the subject of tonight's program. David will join us in a little bit, but for now, please join me in welcoming Catherine Stewart. Thank you so much. Thanks to Town Hall and to David and I work. I hope everyone watching from home is safe and healthy. I don't need to tell anyone here that this pandemic is a historic tragedy. And at a time like this, it would be great to have national leaders who could bring us together, address this crisis in an evidence-based fashion, and work collaboratively and without political favoritism to alleviate the suffering of all Americans, and particularly those among us who are bearing the highest costs. Unfortunately, that's not what we have. I won't belabor the point, but I think we all know by now two things. We know what sort of person Donald Trump is, and we know that he wouldn't be where he is today without the support of what many people call the Christian right, but I often prefer to call religious nationalism or Christian nationalism. So here's the one thought I wanna put forward on Trump and his religious nationalist supporters. 
There's a story that people like to tell, according to which Trump's hyper-conservative religious base held their noses and voted for him in a purely transactional way. And I'm gonna to suggest to you tonight that this story is in large part false. Trump and Trumpian politics represents something essential about Christian nationalism today. And we had better understand that and understand what it is because the real leaders and real followers of the movement are gonna be around a lot longer than he is. So you see, when we think about the religious right, we're often thinking of a social movement that works from the bottom up. It expresses the anxieties of a particular group in society in reaction to rapidly changing social realities. But religious nationalism works from the top down. It act actively shapes and manipulates its target population, and it often shifts its target. When we think of the religious right, we're also usually thinking of a cultural movement. It's about symbols or about certain very specific aspects of modern life, like female reproductive health that have somehow acquired extraordinarily um, cultural significance. But we're dealing with a political movement, not just a cultural movement. It's about power. So religious nationalism in America, as I'm gonna explain in this talk, did not arise out of the abortion issue it created the abortion issue in its quest for political power. When we think of the religious right, we usually imagine it as one more special interest group in the noisy form of American democracy. We may agree or disagree with its positions, but we see it as competing within the existing system for votes and looking for a seat at the table. But this is a movement that does not believe in liberal democracy. Its aim is to smash the table to overthrow the system as we know it and to create a new type of order, one in which, it, which its leaders, along with members of certain approved religious groups, supposedly approved religious groups and their political allies will enjoy positions of exceptional privilege in politics, law, and society. Members of this movement talk a good game about patriotism. You'll often see them in red, white, and blue, holding up portraits of George Washington and so on. But religious nationalism is not remotely unique to America. In fact, one of the most <laughs> aspects of the movement is its affinity for and its alliance with religious nationalists around the world. So when Vladimir Putin in Russia or Viktor Orban in Hungary or Erdogan in Turkey bind themselves closely to religious conservatives in their countries, to consolidate an authoritarian form of power. We rightly understand this as a form of religious nationalism. And we're seeing this today with Trump's alliances with hyper conservative religious leaders in America. My book, The Power Worshippers, is a deep dive into the machinery of the movement, its inner workings and leading personalities. Tonight, I wanna to focus on four areas, messaging through churches, a focus on the ideology of the movement, um, leaders in particular, the role of money and the international alliance. So let's start with messaging through churches. Leaders of the movement has, have figured out that pastors drive votes. And so they organize pastors into networks that get them all on the same page politically and give them tools to help them turn out the vote for hyper-conservative candidates that the movement favors from their perspective, vast numbers of loyals um, of America's hyper-conservative churches have been converted into what are essentially cells of a shadow political party. So when I was researching this book, I went to some of these events organized by these you know, pastor networks. I wanna give you an idea of what this looks like on the ground. Um, at one event, I found myself at a small church in rural North Carolina with dozens of evangelical pastors from the area. The event was aimed at teaching them how to communicate to their congregations the key issues that supposedly matter in elections and the supposedly biblically correct way to vote on them. The event was organized by Watchmen on the Wall. It's a project of the Family Research Council, which is one of the most powerful policy groups of the Christian right. Watchmen of the Wall claims to have over 20 to, um, 25,000 pastor members. Actually, some people say the number is quite a bit higher. 
And it's been openly endorsed by Republican political leaders, including Vice President Mike Pence. So as soon as I got there, I could tell this was clearly not a politically neutral affair. Family Research Council President Tony Perkins spoke at the event. He said, I believe this last election, 2016, was the result of prayer. We've seen our nation begin to move back to a nation that respects the sanctity of life. So what he's signaling here and this is that the single issue that matters most, perhaps the only one that really matters that pastors should care about, um, is abortion. They know that if you can get people to vote on a single issue, or maybe just one or two issues, you can get their vote. Quoting from the book of Ephesians, Perkins told the pastors, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. The wiles of the devil. It was clear from his speech that the so-called wiles of the devil were to be found on the democratic side of the aisle. The members of your congregation need to vote, Perkins told the pastors. He said, as pastors, you need to, I'm not gonna say challenge them, you need to tell them to vote. Now, there wasn't the slightest doubt about which way Perkins expected pastors to tell their congregants to vote. Then pastors were instructed to form culture impact teams. The idea is for pastors to create within their churches teams of congregants that will, as they describe it, advance kingdom values in the public arena, kingdom values. So pastors are instructed to figure out which members of their congregation are politically active, well-connected with other members, and motivated to get them to vote according to these so-called biblical values. And they give them these incredibly comprehensive tools to do that. I wanna show you one of them. This is a culture impact team manual, resource manual. It's got, you know, like a large number of pages, maybe 200 pages of instructions. So they're not just telling people to get out and motivate other, other congregants to vote. They have these incredibly sophisticated resources and tools and messaging materials to help them do it. A fundamental motivation behind the culture impact team is to get around um, the IRS guidelines that require that pastors should refrain from campaigning for candidates from the pulpit. But nothing stops congregants at churches themselves from undertaking their own church-based political activism as long as it's supposedly all about the culture. Several years ago, a pastor I interviewed about this type of initiative called it a God-given loophole. He said, it threads this church and state separation loophole. So it's not me telling the congregants, you know, how to vote and who to vote for, it's the congregants telling their other congregants. So he saw this as a kind of a loophole, but it was him directing the action from the top. So let me tell you something about the political messaging of the movement leaders. When they're talking to congregants or talking to the pastors about talking to the congregants, you know, to help them figure out how to get out their vote, it's all abortion all the time. Abortion is the beginning and the end. In fact, I heard one leader tell a group of pastors at another kind of pastoral gathering, sort of network gathering, if someone asks you about the minimum wage, you ask them, what's more important, a few extra dollars or a life? extra dollars are life. So, you know, that's the message they're giving to their congregants. But when you look at the political messages in greater detail, and especially the ones that they're sending to one another and to the elites in power, it's not just about abortion. A lot of it is about money. It's about how the Bible favors low taxes or no taxes, um, certainly for the rich, how the Bible favors minimal government or no government, minimal government regulation of business, um, minimal government regulation of the environment, um, and how the Bible is against, um, you know, uh, public funding of the social safety net, um, unless the social safety net is managed by the church. But we'll get into that later. So first I wanna tell you what I learned when I visited a large agricultural fair in California's San Joaquin Valley. I was there to attend the 20th anniversary celebration of Ralph Drollinger, the founder of Capital Ministries. He targets political leaders at the top levels of government with his ministry. 
um, these weekly Bible study group in the Capitol has been attended by at least 12 members of uh, current and former members of Trump's cabinet, including Vice President Mike Pence. You can go online, all the stuff is out there. He's not hiding it at all. You could look at, um, I think it's catmin.net. Uh, it's his website. He puts his Bible studies online and he has a, a group of what they call um, capital sponsors. And Mike Pence is up there, Pompeo, um, uh, Alex Azar, uh, Betsy DeVos. So this is all, in, it's all out there in the open. And um, he also has Bible study groups, by the way, targeting the Senate and House of Representatives. So Drollinger is arguably the most politically influential pastor in America. So why did a man of such influence hold his 20th anniversary celebration at an agricultural fair in the San Joaquin Valley? Well, that's because not only did he start out his ministry in California, which is where Drollinger is from, but a lot of his early funding was some owners of large scale agribusiness conglomerates. And indeed, Trump's agricultural secretary, Sonny Perdue, was on hand at this event that I attended in the San Joaquin Valley to deliver a full throated endorsement. Now, the expansiveness on Drollinger's positions on domestic, economic, and foreign policy hits home the fact that Christian nationalism is a political movement. It's not merely a stance on the so called culture war. He weighs in on a number of these social and economic policy questions, including the idea that social welfare programs have no basis in scripture. In his Bible study guides, which are he teaches to political leaders, he says, the responsibility to meet the needs of the poor lie first with the husband in a marriage, secondly with a family if the husband is absent, and thirdly with a church. Nowhere does God command the institutions of government or commerce to fully support those with genuine needs. So another one of his Bible study guides makes clear that God's beliefs in deregulation. He writes, leaders must incentivize individuals and industries, which includes unencumbering them from the unnecessary burdens of government regulation. So Drollinger also has words of wisdom for laborers. He's got a Bible study guide titled, Toward a Better Biblical Understanding of Lawmaking. And he cites from the New Testament, the first letter of Peter 2.18, servants be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. So here he explains the economy of Rome at the time of Peter's writing was one of slave and master. The principle today of submitting to one's boss carries over to today. I mean, he's actually really big on submitting. He thinks women should submit to their wives, to their husbands, and et cetera, but we won't go there right now. This is all music to the ears of agribusiness leaders, many of whom rely on minimal workers' rights and economic and environmental deregulation to maintain and increase their profits. It's an ideology, as I explain in my book, that's descended from pro-slavery ideology. Um, sort of an alliance with big money, the idea of these sort of hierarchies um, ordained by God. Um, so there's a through line from this idea of America as a supposedly Christian nation rooted in these hierarchies, um, so-called biblical hierarchies, between the theology of the clerical defenders of slavery and the political theologians of today, the sort of hyper-conservative political theologians of today. And it is widely parroted by other members of the movement, including David Barton. If any of you guys don't know who he is, you should look him up. He is a historical revisionist who I call the Where's Waldo of the Christian Nationalist Movement because he sits on the boards of so many of its key initiatives. Barton too has argued that the Bible and God oppose progressive income taxes, capital gains taxes, and minimum wage laws. And he uses the issue of slavery, like uh, Drollinger in a way, to make his point. He's got an essay titled, The Bible, Slavery, and America's Founders. And he writes in it, and it's also online, or at least it was last I checked, different, which is just a month ago or so, different forms of slavery have replaced the more obvious system of past centuries, as Barton wrote this, he said, the slave has assumed the role of master for many, providing aid and assistance, and with it, more and more control to those unable to provide for themselves. 
the only solution to slavery is the liberty of the gospel. So he's not only deracializing and you know yanking the whole issue of the enslavement of human beings wildly out of context, but he is also calling you know like food stamps or other forms of government assistance slavery to the state. Um, so the next topic I want to address is money. Christian nationalists seek to secure and even expand public sources of funding. The movement has learned to siphon public money through subsidies, tax deductions, grants, vouchers, and other schemes. This flow of funds has in turn shaped the ambitions and tactics of the movement. So they don't want the government you know, to transfer resources to the needy directly, but they want to siphon money from the government for their initiatives. And then perhaps some of it will trickle down, maybe not. Um, so the role of public money is huge. The calls for religious freedom that characterize much of its activism today, though undoubtedly bound up in a sincerely held belief that conservative Christians should be able to discriminate against LGBT Americans and others are as loud and passionate as they are because they're grounded in a fear among movement leaders that their discriminatory inclinations might cost them their lucrative tax deductions and subsidies but even more than holding on to the gravy they've already got, activists have their eyes on a vast potential flow of public money in the future. This has become explicitly clear in the field of public education uh, where religiously motivated activists are determined to expand access to school vouchers. Um, much of the money for school vouchers flows to uh, Religious schools, I think, in Florida, state of Florida, it's something like eighty percent, and much of those, many of those schools teach, you know, creationism, contempt for people of other faiths, and the like. So those religiously motivated um, voucher activists have placed a key voucher case before the Supreme Court. Um, it's called Espinova, Espinoza versus Montana Department of Revenue. The leaders of the movement understand that the potential flow of money is immense. The, U the U.S. spends something close to $600 billion per year on public K-12 education. And religious nationalists know that if they can get their hands on a portion of that figure in the name of what they call religious liberty, then the money will flow without end. And it's not just about education. In fact, this past winter, eight federal agencies proposed changes in how they will work with religious organizations. This is a move intended to increase the flow of public money in their direction too, and mandate taxpayer funded discrimination against women, against members of religious minority groups, against the non-religious, against um, LGBT Americans, all in the name of religious liberty. So, Let's look at the international piece of this because um, religious nationalists often like to talk about American exceptionalism and our religious nationalism may be one of the least exceptional things about us. Um, this crops up all over the world. Um, you know, the uh, in Russia collusion thing, the collusion thing wasn't just like a tactical one-off where Trump made an alliance with a single foreign entity that supposedly wanted to help him. Under Trump, the United States has become a flashing beacon of hope for a new tactical alliance. It calls itself the global conservative movement. It claims that it seeks to defend the natural family, but um, really it's about taking down modern democracy and replacing with authoritarian faith-based ethnostates. You could kind of, you know, kind of call it a, a global holy war. So the Christian nationalist movement within the United States is in reality just one piece of this inter, interconnected globe-spanning movement. Um, the global conservative movement, as they call it, has nuances sp specific to different countries, um, but each defines itself against a single common worldwide enemy, that is global liberalism equality, and the values of the enlightenment. So when I was researching the power worshipers, I went to one of their annual conferences. It's called the World Congress of Families. In 2019, it was held in Verona, Italy. 
I heard a popular right-wing American radio host describe the common foe in this very international group as, quote, the anti-cultural processes of globalization and its secular aristocracy. Another speaker from Spain named a familiar hit list, radical feminists, the abortion industry, and the LGBT totalitarians. He warned the crowd of the urgent need to, quote, break the ice cap of political correctness. And he said, please try to make liberal politicians and decision makers fear you. So another speaker, a Russian activist who has insinuated himself in a host of far-right American groups, I'm telling you, he was like Maria Butina 2.0. Do you remember her from the National Prayer Breakfast? So he said, oh, this guy has been involved in the, the hyper-conservative Christian film business and also the homeschooling world. And he was on this homeschooling panel uh, with two other Americans. And he said, the scientific worldview the Darwin theory, it's the same organizations, the same people who promote LGBT gender rights, it goes in one package. He nodded, he said, quote, gays and Darwin, somehow they are connected. He said that. So this movement, this global holy war, if you will, has an unmistakable theocratic vision that American right-wing radio host I mentioned early, he said, we are not medievalist throwbacks. We are the future. And there is nothing, absolutely nothing, the secular world can do about that. The World Congress of Families got its start over 25 years ago when American and Russian activists gathered in Russia. Looking around at my fellow conference goers, it occurred to me that if the Russian government wanted to um, man, uh, manipulate the politics of the West as effectively as it, as it controls its own population, it could hardly have found a more useful collection of people. So, you know, to close, now that I've given you the bad news, I want to give you some good news. The rise of Christian nationalism, nationalism should alarm all of us who care about the future of democracy in America, but it should not be the cause of despair. Overcoming this kind of reactionary and authoritarian movement isn't just something Americans can do. It is what has made Americans what we are. Many Americans today are mobilizing to confront the threat, including so many of you in this virtual room, when right-wing ideologues have sought to disenfranchise voters, to suppress the vote, to pervert the meeting of freedom of conscience and freedom of speech, to target the rights of specific communities, to claim neutrality when what they really mean is privilege, to defend criminal actions by their enablers, Americans have organized to meet the challenge. And while it is true that a sector of the media has essentially been enlisted in a propaganda campaign, we can't um, uh, underestimate the effect of that sort of right, you know, hyper-conservative far-right propaganda sphere and how it's de-educated so much of the American public. There are many other journalists who are working hard to bring the truth to light. In some ways, Christian nationalism is the fruit of a society that has not yet lived up to the promise of the American idea. There's work to be done, but for now we're free to do it. We've met these challenges in the past, imperfectly perhaps, but well enough to make it to the present moment. Religious nationalists are using the tools of democracy the tools of democratic political culture to end democracy. I continue to believe that those same resources can be used to restore it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. So, okay, I guess we'll uh, continue with our conversation. I'm getting an audio issue here. Um, why am I getting an echo of, an echo of my, myself? Do you know?
Hi everyone, this is Josh from Town Hall. Uh, I'm I'm here to help out with some technical difficulties. David, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Are you still having an echo on your end? Yeah. Okay. One of our one of our tech people will call you in just a second. Okay. okay. All right. <sighs> There we go. <laughs> Are we good? Hi, this is yes, Josh again. So, David, can you can you hear me? Are you yeah. having an echo anymore? I, I'm doing good. Catherine, doing Catherine, Catherine, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yes. All right. Okay, now I can hear you because I couldn't hear you for a minute there. Okay, so I think we're good. Sorry about, about those technical issues. I don't know how it opened up that other window. So, so are are we now proceeding live? Yes, we are. We are live again and back up and running. Go right ahead. All right. All right. Great. Uh, thanks so much for that great introduction, Catherine. I'm sorry for the uh, technical issue there. Um, so, um, what? Can you tell us a little bit about, I mean, the story, how you wound up going down this road? I mean, this wasn't something you normally do. I, I, <laughs> well, I was an investigative journalism, but life happened and, you know, I had a couple of kids and published a couple of novels, but I sort of right. got into this topic. Um, really, my eyes were opened in 2008 when a good news club came to my daughter's public elementary school in Santa Barbara, California. And good news clubs are designed to convert little children in their earliest years of learning, like kids as young as five and six years old, into a deeply fundamentalist form of evangelical Christianity. Um, they confuse little children into thinking their public school endorses a form of religion. And these uh, clubs uh, encourage children attending uh, the clubs to proselytize and recruit their classmates at school. Um, the centerpiece of their program is called a wordless book. It's got no words, just pictures and shapes. So it's used to convert children who are like literally too young to read. So I was astonished to learn that there were thousands of these clubs operating in public schools nationwide because little children can't make a distinction between something taught by their in their school and something endorsed by their school, like public schools have a cloak of authority in their minds and they think if it's being taught in their school, it must be true. So the more I learned about these clubs and the movement behind them, the more concerned I became. I was really stunned by the movement's legal sophistication, its determination, its coherence and high level of strategic thinking. And as I was reporting on this assault on public education, I realized it was just one piece of a much bigger story 
the religious right has launched an attack on America as a modern constitutional democracy. And we're at an all hands on deck moment. So I wrote this book, The Power Worshippers, because I really felt like I had to do my piece. Yeah, the, well, there was, a, a, of course, I, I live in Ballard and uh, and this is uh, all a Seattle town hall. So uh, it, there was a Ballard piece to this, or wasn't there? Absolutely. The first chapter of my last book, uh, published in 2012, The Good News Clubs, takes place in Ballard. Um, I spend time with two pastors, uh, a United Methodist pastor and an evangelical pastor whose church sponsors a Good News Club and the United Methodist pastor is sort of supports separation of church and state and sees and understands that this is really a critical part of true religious freedom um, and just takes a very different view uh, and, you know, of the whole thing. And so both churches were in Ballard. And I also focused on the Good News Club that had been established in the Ballard Public School. And it just caused so much drama, you know, as Good News Clubs do uh, when one religion forces itself into a public elementary school that serves a diverse population you know, you're igniting these needless religious wars. Um, I mean, if our schools are to function effectively in a society as diverse as ours, we really need, they need to serve all families and all families need to be comfortable there. We should leave our political agendas and our religious agendas um, behind and really come together in support of our children and their future. Well, well, the church in Ballard that was particularly the I think one of the focuses uh, is one that, that certainly I'm familiar with because it was way too close to my home. But I think a lot of people in Seattle are very familiar with the Mars Hill Church because it turned into this nightmarish thing. I mean, they they had they had uh, affiliate churches all throughout the city, and they were all preaching this version of Christianity that ultimately I thought, I mean, one of the things that, that really scared me about it was that they were really deeply authoritarian. And this is authoritarianism presented itself in a lot of ways, particularly in what they preached as far as, you know, the relationship of uh, husbands to wives and men to women, but in everything else as well, including submission to authorities. And, um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, this obviously, you know, it was something that certainly back in the 2000s that I became uh, observant. I was watching this growing authoritarianism among uh, the evangelical crowd, and it really bled over into politics. Uh, so, so that during the Tea Party years, we saw this growth of political authoritarianism as well. Yeah, it's really sure. true. I mean, the movement is deeply authoritarian. It's an anti-democratic movement. And yeah. uh, I think that that's really explicit. I think a lot of people have asked the question, how could people who purport to care about values and family values support a leader like Trump? Right. And uh, some people think it's simply transactional. And it's true that he's worked overtime to pay, repay them for their loyalty. You know, he won a higher share of their vote than any of his Republican predecessors by making a deal with them, um, and he's repaying them by appointing judges favorable to their interests. Um, he's already put a stamp on over 22% of the federal judiciary. Um, he's promising them a steady flow of public dollars and granting members of the movement kind of unprecedented, um, unparalleled political access and power. But, you know, there's more to it than just a kind of transactionalism. They, in turn, have sort of elevated Trump's presidency to the level of biblical prophecy, referring to him as King David or King Cyrus, an imperfect vessel through which God delivers his goal. And, but it, it's not an accident that they're sort of um, referring to him as a king. You know, kings don't have to follow the rules. They are a law unto themselves. And... Um, there's something about this movement, the authoritarianism of the movement that uh, see, um, almost seems to want the hard hand of the despot. You know, it's an intensely sort of tribal movement. It's super hyper partisan, you know, everything's like you're in, you're inside or you're outside, you're pure or impure. Um, 
And, uh, you know, if you're, if you're like fighting for your tribe against your in internal enemies, you don't want like the, the nice guy who's going to follow the rules. You want the, the tough guy who's going to, you know, break the rules and crack heads as long as those heads belong to your perceived political enemies. Well, one of my favorite things about your book, uh, and I really hope everyone picks up a copy because it's just an excellent, excellent book, uh, is that you really, you, I mean, you kind of expose that there, that there is this underlying authoritarianism partly through showing, I mean, one of the, 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 the big bungaboo, the big bugbear, the, the focus of so much of their energy is abortion and yet when we look at it they weren't really you know i think the first six seven years after roe v wade we hardly heard anything from the evangelical crowd it wasn't until they started realizing well we need to have something other than race that we can organize around because people like jerry falwell had been he had built his reputation on uh, you know, running this desegregation, these all white schools, right? And desegregation and or getting around Brown v. Board of Education. And so this was all in many ways is a, a reaction to civil rights laws and civil rights advances, but the, they had to sublimate that racial part of it. And you really get into that and it really expose how uh, Roe v. Wade was just a sort of uh, substitute in many ways for what ultimately is this underlying drive to just seize power by any means possible through through religious means through a religious front right it's, I mean, it's definitely true i mean they were really incensed um the sort of leaders of the new right which is a sort of intellectual movement that played a really uh outsized role in creating what is now the religious nationalist movement today were really upset about the fact that um, the IRS was starting to look at uh, Bob Jones Sr.'s uh, segregated Christian Academy and, and thinking about possibly revoking, um, you know, just calling into question, like, why is this guy getting all these tax privileges? Now, Bob Jones Sr., let's remember who he was. He delivered a sermon uh, called Is Segregation Scriptural? He went so far as to call segregation God's established order. And he referred to desegregationists as satanic propagandists. I mean, they really, um, the movement, uh, they, you know, identified uh, desegregation with Satan. It's unbelievable. So Religious this, freedom, right? Exactly. So the <laughs> fear that the Supreme Court might end tax exemptions for these segregated Christian schools. But they knew that as you mentioned, that sort of stop the tax on segregation, it wasn't going to be an effective rallying cry to inspire kind of the broad, kind of broad paced right. hyper counter revolution they wanted. So there is this fascinating episode where they got together and decided that abortion would be a, a more palatable issue. But let's like look at what was happening at that time. So when Roe v. Wade was passed, an editorial and wire service run by the Southern Baptist Convention itself held the decision as they called it a, something like a sensible middle ground. I mean, most um, Protestant uh, Republicans at the time supported liberalization of abortion law. Um, Barry Goldwater, that great conservative hero, he supported abortion liberalization at least early in his career and his wife Peggy was a co-founder of Planned Parenthood. I believe it was Billy Graham himself who said at one point, there's a quote, I think it's 1968, he said, um, I believe in Planned Parenthood, is referring to abortion. Um, but, you know, activists like Phyllis Schlafly and others really saw the potential for the abortion issue to unite this new movement. And so um, there had been a lot of pro-choice voices in the Republican Party, and they were purged from the party. So today what you see is a kind of pro-life religion. And it's a modern creation. It was created for political purposes. At the last um, Values Voter Summit I attended, you know, at the beginning of the summit, it's like a big gathering of all the religious right, a lot of religious right activists. Tony Perkins got up on stage and um, these people literally wheeled these massive cribs filled with baby cats. And this is how it kind of, this is like his opening stunt to, you know, to uh, kick off this Values Voter Summit. 
and signal it's all about saving the babies, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, you know, it's a circle back around to authoritarianism as well. Which you mentioned the talked about uh, the Rus role of Russian disinformation, misinformation, and all this. Of course, I've been, uh, I just wrote a, a story for Daily Coast uh, about uh, this uh, Russian organization that's called the uh, Russian Imperial Movement. Uh, that uh, just got named a terrorist organization by the U.S. State Department. Uh, and these guys are one of the main organizers of the World uh, Conservative uh, Conference. Uh, they held it in, in Moscow this year, or last year, I think it was. Uh, yeah, and they are absolutely, they're 100% dedicated to the destruction of liberal democracy, they use uh, appeals to re religious traditionalism to do it, but uh, ultimately these people are just fascists. Let <laughs> this is be clear. Well, it's, it's interesting. Uh, the World Congress of Families was what well, was held in Verona. This year they didn't do it. Um, it was supposed to have been held, or I heard it was going to be held in um, Brazil, but obviously it's um, there are no conferences taking place right now. Um, yeah. But the, the authoritarianism that you mentioned is, is, is really true. It's very interesting that, um, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, Trump is always praising authoritarian leaders and um, one wonders, you know, yeah. who envies them. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, Orban just basically uh, ended democracy in Hungary, correct? I mean, yeah. Yeah. The, there's no longer a Congress or a courts or a free press in Hungary or yeah. free press in Hungary. Yeah. 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 You're punished for uh, promoting uh, what they call fake news. Yeah. Or, uh, yeah. The government. yeah. Well, and, and of course, among the things that, uh, that they're all making use of right now is the coronavirus crisis uh, pandemic. Um, and I've been writing quite a bit about how uh, interestingly, a lot of the, the resistance to stay-at-home orders and the, 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 uh, the social distancing measures and things like that is actually coming from these uh, very large, the mega churches, these uh, Christian evangelical churches, mm -hmm. as well as, of course, my old friends you know, from the Bundy family, the Cleon Skousen devotees. So. Yeah, I mean, just held a thing this last weekend in Idaho. So, yeah, and I think there, um, you know, it really goes beyond the issue of disregarding the warnings. And I think it's important to note that many evangelical churches are doing very helpful things uh, and really trying to observe social distancing. Uh, and some of those that are flouting social distancing uh, include some Catholic and Jewish congregations as well. But my concern here really when it comes to the coronavirus is with this, um, this political movement that cloaks itself in religious rhetoric because um, I think there's a number of ways that the religious right bears some responsibility for the current incompetence in our national response. I mean, first and foremost, the movement promotes a kind of anti-science culture that rejects the evidence of science and expertise and rejects critical thinking and that's obviously one of the reasons you, you continue to have these hyper-conservative religious congregations that are calling the coronavirus overhyped and just you know insisting that they continue to meet. And that has obviously contributed to our inability to sort of address this um, crisis in an evidence-based fashion. Um, second, I think this is really obvious right now. We have a poorly developed collective infrastructure and. That's a consequence of the sort of far right wing economic policy and government bashing. Um, and the religious right is implicated in that too. The movement's allied itself completely um, with the sort of libertarian economic conservative wing of the Republican party. And so it does share some of the blame that falls on that group. Um, uh, religious nationalists support politicians and policies that have led to the privatization of healthcare the undermining of government everywhere. They're always sort of bashing government and seeking to hollow out the social safety net. 
Um, even going so far as to call programs like food stamps and housing assistance unbiblical or against the biblical model, which is what um, a representative of the Family Research Council said. So, you know, when you've got a really big collective problem, you need a more collective solution. You need to be able to take care of the most vulnerable members um, of, our, of, our, of our country, most economically vulnerable members. And this, this is like this sort of ultra, like reliance on, on the, um, you know, the idea that corporations have all the answers and, and you can't really expect government to have a collective or a coordinated response to an enormous reason we're unprepared for this crisis. And, you know, I think a third reason is that the um, uh, religious nationalism has driven the Republican Party to kind of hyper-partisanization it's like a zero-sum game within this, all politics, all spin view of the world. Um, and that's why I think many movement leaders, like Jerry Falwell Jr., read the news of the coronavirus as an insult to Trump. I mean, in mid-March, when it was obvious to everybody that the coronavirus was really going to be this health, public health crisis, um, he cast it as an attempt to get Trump. He, he went on Fox News and said it was like a hype and an overreaction. And one of the most tragic casualties of this kind of fact-free hyperpartisanship is competent government. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that's, you know, it's sort of a, a, has always been a, a problem with far-right government is that it can't assess acts accurately because it's, it's too dedicated to it's narrative and it rejects any facts that don't meet their narrative. So they're unable to keep up with realities on the ground, which is inevitably catches up to them. Um, and it's one of the clear advantages of, of democracy over an authoritarian system is that it has that flexibility. But, um, you know, I mean, part of a lot of what I've been seeing going on, especially online, and particularly with uh, some of the younger people attracted to this, is that there um, is there's a fair amount of sort of nihilism out there uh, that uh, makes people that actually makes people feel that well you can't you can't trust any of the media, and so let's we'll just create our own reality. And it becomes yeah. a, a kind of an alternative universe. I mean, that's why, I mean, I titled my book Alt America, Alt America, because I was describing this alternative universe that right-wing extremists create for themselves. But this is really acutely the case with people in this religious uh, part of the bubble because it's, they have their communities. They're actually able to live in this bubble that they create themselves. Everybody agrees with them, and as far as they know, the whole world thinks like they do, right? So it becomes a self-affirming uh, cycle of disinformation that they fully believe in. And a lot of these folks actually, you know, believe it in good faith. They, 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 they're well-meaning, some of them. <laughs> Not the leaders, but, but a lot of the followers are folks I have compassion for. Uh, mostly because they wind up becoming victims. I mean, I haven't yet ever in my 34 years of covered writing about this stuff. Uh, I haven't ever yet a, a right-wing political operation that at the end of the day wasn't a, a money-making scam and mm -hmm. that didn't destroy the lives of the people who got involved in it. Well, it's interesting. I remember at another conference I went to, I heard um, one of these leaders say, our people shouldn't have to, you know, they shouldn't be looking at the fake news, which they, you know, consider CNN and, you know, uh, you know, major networks. And he said, you know, we're we've got our own um, media, and that's all they should be looking at. We're working on more. I mean, the rank and file have been told over and over to dismiss real news as fake news, and so they don't heed these public health warnings and evidence-based information in this case that could sort of help preserve life or, or their lives or flatten a curve. They're taking their cues instead from their media, but especially you know, from an unstable president who's playing this for partisan gain and really doesn't appear to care about public health of the nation. 
or his cronies who, as you mentioned, are out there hawking sort of unproven remedies or, um, you know, profiting from the disease. Um, hey, yeah. Just not so much profiting. But <laughs> 5G people. causes coronavirus, you know. <laughs> they, they're protected by their faith, you know. Right, right. Yeah. Right. That they can pray it away. Right. So, or, or, you know, I, I'm sure you do too, get lots of email from like the Alliance to Offending Freedom and these other sort of right-wing legal organizations and policy groups. And they're um, calling uh, the sort of stay-at-home orders. They're really intended to sort of protect yeah. life overall and government overreach, especially like specifically as it relates to church attendance. Right. So, yeah. Well, Evan Bundy was calling it martial <laughs> law this weekend, so. Right. <laughs> Sometimes they, they like government when it does what they like, and they oh. when it does what they does what they don't like. So. Right? Yeah. No. It was. It's funny how they love that government overreach when when it's talking about our sex lives. <laughs> you, know, I, you mentioned something really important. I think we really should flesh it out. I think it makes sense when you're discussing the movement to distinguish between the leaders and the followers. I mean, I think yeah. you know. Um, the followers are attracted to the movement for a large number of uh, sometimes lovely reasons. You know, people want to sort of experience a community or they um, want to find meaning in life. And this is sort of what gives them meaning, but, um, or they, you know, have a genuine, you know, love of God and scripture and, and they sort of find themselves in this, in this world. But, you know, I think, for, for too many of them, the price of belonging is a kind of surrendering of their political will um, to these leaders who sort of promise to offer uh, order in, uh, and certainty in an uncertain world. Um, right. And it winds up just being chaos. Yes. Yeah. So we should get to the questions. Um, okay. We've got a bunch of them lined up here waiting for us. So, um, the first one, there's a couple of them that have uh, four votes. Uh, first one is, uh, you said that churches are used as tools for pastors to get their congregants on board with issues some of importance of yeah, to the right of, wing. Yeah. Is that is that mostly done through the sermons, or are there other ways pastors poli politically influence their congregations? Um, a number of ways. Number one, uh, sometimes in the sermons, I attended that uh, Mars Hill Church, we discussed this, uh, that uh, Mars Hill Church, and at that sermon I attended, it was a completely, you know, uh, anti-abortion sermon. It was all about, you know, it's all about, you know, the babies, saving the babies. So they deliver those kinds of messages. But um, there are other tools that they use. They use sophisticated tools like this culture impact teams. They establish, they're told to establish culture impact teams at their churches. They're given these voter guides that uh, are distributed at church and uh, indicate a very clear way that there's a, a correct, supposedly correct way to vote your biblical values and uh, an incorrect way. And then there's um, uh, churches, uh, conservative churches play a, a quite a substantial role in the sort of data strategy of the religious right. Um, uh, the um, uh, pastors who are sort of in these networks are given data tools to actually compare voter rolls with church membership. And they can kind of see how people, but whether people voted in the last election, whether they turned out to vote, and then they can figure out how to sort of target members of their congregation um, through a tool called, um, there's a church, it's, one is called Church Voter Lookup, and another tool is called Individual Voter Lookup. And they can actually see um you know whether certain individuals within their church vote in the last election and potentially target them with messages to get them to turn out to vote so it's through data you know uh, uh, messaging tools and uh and these other means gotcha um so the next one is thanks for this important talk my question, why do you refer, prefer the phrase uh, religious nationalism instead of what you're talking about, which is a Christian nationalism or more aptly white Christian supremacy? By using religious nationalism, aren't you taking folks away from the 
actual source, a source which, as you mentioned, looks down upon and lumps other faiths, looks, upon, down, looks down upon other faith traditions and lumps all other religions into this movement, which supports oh. anti-religion views in our country. Appreciate your talk. Thank you so much for that great question. There's so much to unpack here. The first yeah. is, <laughs> um, it includes evangelicals, but it also excludes many evangelicals too. Let's remember, let's not put all any one religious group in one group. Every religious group is quite diverse. Evangelicalism is diverse too. So it includes evangelicals and, ex and excludes even many evangelicals too. And it includes representatives of a variety of both Protestant and non-Protestant religion. And um, there are many political allies um, who are um, members of other non-Christian religions who are also um, lend support to this movement. Um, I mean, let's not, let's, we, we have to remember this is not a religion, it's a political ideology. Its representatives insist that the foundation of government is bound up with a reactionary understanding of religion, but it's not any particular one religion. Um, and uh, you mentioned sort of the issue of race. I think that's really important to break down. Um, the, um, the, for many of the white people in the movement, it is an implicitly white movement in that it sort of ties the idea of America to specific religious and cultural identities. It sort of says that America is a sort of implicitly in their minds, a white Christian nation. Um, and of course, you know, movement leaders tend to paper over the ways in which hyper-conservative religion and racism can reinforce one another. And we also have to remember that Trump won by appealing to the racism of some number of his, um, of some number of voters. But, you know, movement leaders um, can really see the uh, demographic future as clearly as you or I can. And they understand that they're not going to survive if they, um, if they just continue to go after the same people. So they've actually made a significant effort in recent years to reach out to some number of conservative pastors of color, Latino voters, and uh, black voters and, and pastors also often are reaching these voters through uh, conservative leading churches. Um, they've invested some real money in going after um, the Latino uh, and black vote. And I think they're also, because the movement, uh, there's a kind of through line in some of the um, sort of a theological through line from some of the most you know, um, shameful episodes in America's past, sort of Jim Crow, um, just remember um, that uh, religion, conservative religion, the sort of idea of sort of biblical literalist religion was used to justify slavery. So some of the today's movement leaders are very eager to um, protect themselves against accusations of racism. And some of them are actually engaging in um, racial reconciliation efforts. This doesn't let them off the hook. I mean, really what they're doing when they're going after those Latino and black pastors and other figures, they're recruiting them to fight the culture wars that drive support for a movement that has made race-based voter suppression and gerrymandering a strategic imperative. Well, and, and let me kind of toss in there as well that uh, certainly one of the things we've seen over the last three or four years is that uh, authoritarianism uh, tr sort of transcends a lot of those religious boundaries. Um, so the authoritarian appeal of this religious nationalist movement uh, appeals to a lot of folks who are, uh, you know, non-white. Uh, and it's, you know, I mean, it, they make up a very small percentage of the total number of Black and Latino people, but they certainly also allow these Christian nationalists to say, see, we're not bigoted. <laughs> you know, uh, it, and it, it's part of why they cultivate these friendships, I believe. But, um, and it just goes to show how sublimated race has become in all of this discussion. But um, but also, I mean, I, I actually admit, I tend to talk about it as 
Christian nationalism, but let's be clear, there are some of these uh, organizations and movements out there, and I'm thinking, for instance, of Nation of Islam, that are similarly uh, religious nationalists, and they're part of the problem as well. So, um, so why is there no blowback from the Christian churches? None of what the evangelicals are preaching has anything to do with what I understand to be Christianity. Yeah, it's a great question. I, we have to remember there's a whole movement out there um, uh, of, uh, of Christians who reject the politics of you know, conquest and division that this movement represents. A large number of evangelicals, uh, I think perhaps most Americans don't even understand um, some of these uh, uh, theologies as authentically Christian. Um, I think most American Christians see uh, religion ha as having something to do with, you know, loving one another, care for the poor and undefended, and perhaps even, um, you know, seeing people as human beings first and, and tribes second. Um, so this in no way represents a kind of um, majority uh, Christian position. The movement has so much power, not because it's a majority, it's a minority, but in a country where 40 to 50% of people don't even bother to turn out to vote or can't vote and look at increasingly large numbers of people whose votes are actively being suppressed or being disenfranchised. You don't need a majority to win elections. All you need is a really coherent majority, uh, I'm sorry, minority, really coherent and organized. And uh, so the hardcore members- and of Energized, group, yeah. Yeah, energized. They vote in disproportionate numbers. So yep. you know, yeah. here's one of these events, Ralph Reed, he was um, he's the leader of uh, one of the big right wing policy groups and he runs a sort of big get out the vote machine. He said, don't pay attention to the um, poll, uh, the, he said, don't pay attention to the polls. Don't worry about demographics. Our number is shrinking. Um, what matters, what, the only thing that matters is who turns out on election day. And he used this to sort of hit home the point that the sort of true believers, um, uh, as, as George Barna called them, the sage cons, the so spiritually active, governmentally engaged conservatives, they vote in highly disproportionate numbers. And that's why they are able to win elections. Wasn't uh, Reed's faith and freedom outfit, uh, wasn't it actually designed originally to try to sort of capture a lot of the Tea Party energy for on behalf of the evangelical churches? Was it yeah. an attempt to sort of meld the church, the evangelicals with the Tea Party? He's been around for a long time yeah. and he's had different kind of uh, careers. I believe he was involved or in the Christian coalition uh, early on. So he's been uh, a figure uh, okay. quite time. So another question, how is this affecting school curricula and the way that children under the age of 12 perceive religion in our current world of politics and the law? Um, thanks for asking about education. Um, the movement has uh, inserted or attempt is attempting to insert a myriad of um, initiatives into public schools. It's sort of, there's a kind of longstanding hostility to public education. Uh, at the heart of the movement, they um, think that anything that fails to affirm their religion is somehow hostile to them. And so they're, you know, they've sort of pursued a two-pronged strategy, both trying to insert their uh, programs and curricula in some ways into uh, public schools and also um, to defund public schools through uh, the promotion of vouchers and in many instances, religiously or politically themed charters. Um, the charter movement is very diverse. There are many people who are in it for great reasons. There are some great charters out, where, out there, but a surprisingly large number of the charter networks are run by people with conservative, you know, hyper-conservative religious or right-wing sort of ideological agendas. Um, so there are a lot of different types of initiatives targeting not just elementary age, but also targeting um, the high school level. Gotcha. So here's one. Uh, 
somebody responding to the Ballard stuff. Uh, out of curiosity, I attended a Mars Hill sermon. I noticed that the audience was very young. No kidding. <laughs> like folks in their 30s. Does religious nationalism attract younger folks or a broad base of people? Um, you know, it's interesting. That's a great question. The, um, you go to some of these uh, sort of parachurch networks like an Acts 29 church and or like they're using the tools of modernity to sort of deliver a pre-modern pre message in a way. But they offer so much to, you know, on the surface, they offer so much to a young person. Often they'll uh, go after young people um, in like university centers where people are really you know, might be lonely because they're away from their families and just trying to establish their own identities. They really do offer a sense of community and a sense of purpose. Um, often the music is terrific. You know, the, they'll use kind of hip graphics and, you know, the pastor seems kind of cool and they've got this amazing worship band. But, um, you know, I've been, to a lot of these, I've been to a lot of these kinds of church services and the people who are attending weren't really like digging deeper like what are the if you if you dig into the documents like the sort of um not just the mission statement but the sort of like statement of you know beliefs and and the kind of um you know their theological documents you'll find those kinds of hierarchies the sort of um male uh you know they call it male headship uh kind of uh, ideas or ideas about biblical literalism and the sort of emphasis that the biblical values you should be voting you know, on our abortion. They're very anti-gay, obviously. Um, so they they really do make, I think, an effort to go after young people by tailoring the sort of style of church services. But, but, yeah, uh, my observation, my yeah. observation was that they went after uh, particularly young professionals, uh, mm -hmm. people who were more settled down uh, but they also, uh, I mean, the younger, those, the, the Mars Hill churches are very much geared to younger people. There's a whole, there's a whole ecosystem of evangelical churches in the Seattle area that often they uh, actually do uh, cater to older folks, particularly out in the suburban churches. So, and that's where you find the different demographics. But these urban uh, evangelical churches are very, very much geared to young people, and it's it's kind of it's kind of geared towards appealing to what they're who they're actually appealing to is people who actually never went to church when they were young people and never had much exposure to religion in their lives, and suddenly they give them, you know, they get the the kumbaya stuff and the the warm and fuzzy sing-alongs, and everybody feels good and. And that's how they pull them in, you know. And suddenly, oh, we're gonna. Oh, by the way, you have to. You wives have to obey your husbands and do whatever he says. <laughs> that sort of stuff, you know. They start. They layer it on slowly. The the authoritarian aspects of it. Do you think? Yeah, I have a whole bunch of church planting manuals. In, yeah, yeah. In and uh, often it's about like tailoring churches to the you know wherever you want to go. If you're if, one thing that I found is really fascinating. So if you're um, planting in a more working class area, you should, uh, the pastor can have a more authoritarian style of delivery because it will remind people of their bosses and they'll be more accustomed to sort of submitting. And they said, if you are planting in a more wealthy area, you should have a more egalitarian style. So it's like, it's very interesting because pe that's what people will respond to better. I mean, I think, you know, if you're in, you know, you go to a cowboy area, you can find a cowboy church. And there's just, right. you know, look, I mean, there's nothing wrong with houses of worship, you know, establishing those right. well, areas that where they want to, you know, um, reach people. We have a, Absolutely. A, because we've had separation of church and state and, and no state religion, we kind of have a free marketplace of religions. And religions have gotten quite good at marketing to different sectors of society. The problem I have here is not with religion. It's this is a kind of, um, it's a it's a political movement cloaking itself in religious rhetoric, and it's not trying to see, you know, achieve religious, social, or cultural aims. It's really trying to achieve political power. And uh, again, it's an anti-democratic movement specifically because it, you know, seems to have very little respect for the Constitution or um, 
the two party, as it was written, I should say, the constitution as it was written, um, you know, all their, they sort of talk about uh, originalism is kind of a gaslighting. Um, it seems to have little respect for democracy or the two party system itself. I yeah. mean, Paul, Paul Weyrich said it, and then Trump repeated something, some version of it. Paul Weyrich said, um, he's one of the founders of the new right. He said, I don't want everybody to vote. Our influence in elections goes up when the number of people who vote goes down. So that's yep. really not much respect for representative democracy, is it? No, no. In fact, it's become abundantly clear but that actually the Republican Party is becoming hostile to liberal democracy itself. It's, it's, uh, it's really sad. Uh, um, so let's move on. Tony Uzbelli is asking, how are religious nationalists viewing the current COVID-19 pandemic and the response of national and state governments? And of course, we talked about this a little, but maybe we can get into it a little deeper. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure, how are the religious nationalists viewing the COVID-19 pandemic and the response of the governments, national and state, to the, to the pandemic? You know, I, I think that by now it's pretty clear to most people um, that the pandemic is, you know, a real problem. Um, and yes, while there are some uh, uh, folks that are sort of saying, you know, ignore the, you know, ignore the you know, warnings of your local governments. I think most people are probably not ignoring them. Um, but uh, I think one thing that has hampered our collective response is that, um, you know, in the Trump era, we have a kind of, there's a dip, like a, a less respect for expertise in a way. I mean, I think that, um, there's an increasing premium paid for political loyalty and ideological conformity in the movement itself. And, uh, you know, the Trump administration, a huge amount of power has been sort of handed over to these advisors whose motivations are guided by religious ideology or pursuit of power or even um, personal profit and have little to do with serving the wider public interest. Um, you know, it's nice that we have Fauci there and and uh, and some you know other scientists who he allies himself with. But if you look at sort of the coronavirus response team and and uh, some of the, like this is a, I think he announced a team to sort of open up the country again. There wasn't a single epidemiologist or or I think scientist on the panel. Like you know, Jared and Ivanka were there and Mark. <laughs> you know, I mean, ordinarily the like consequences of this type of behavior don't show themselves for quite some time but in the case of a global can pandemic it's like killing it's people media. yeah yeah obvious to ignore. well one of the things that strikes me in all this is that the the religious nationalists are um are really in many ways um i mean they've got wired into their beliefs this utter distrust of the mainstream media. So, and, and this is part of what Trump is actually playing with, is that he's covering up his own incompetence by pointing and, and convincing the religious nationalists who support him that the mainstream media has been lying to them. So many people, particularly in places like Georgia and Alabama, uh, they aren't really too worried about the COVID-19 because they think it's a media hoax or something. So that that's actually also affecting how, uh, what kind of response we're seeing, particularly among some of these governors. And I think it's going to cost lives. So, so we have time for one more question. Let's see. Um, <sighs> let's ask this one because it's, it's a very complex one, actually. How is religious nationalism in the US today the same and different from what engulfed the Middle East in the latter 20th century? Thank you from Catherine Ragsdale. Oh, that's a great question. How is it similar and how is it different? Um, yeah. Well, I think um, 
religious nationalism everywhere is used to sort of rile up a base. Um, I think religious nationalisms around the world often rely on a persecution narrative. Um, they there's a sort of um, and a sort of idea of the insider versus the outsider. There is a sort of a we that they respect and a kind of they that they hate, and that um, unfortunately uh, is is common to religious nationalists around the world. I think the persecution narrative is really you can see it all the time uh, when um, people sometimes you know point out um, some of the um, the fact that religious nationalism, uh, religious nationalists are trying to say, you know, uh, destroy our, some of our most valued um, constitutional principles or, um, or denigrate the idea of equality and plurality that has um, uh, really held our country together perfectly again, but held it together more or less, even as so many other countries have been torn apart by sectarian conflict, religious nationalists say, Oh, you're stamping on us. You're you're pressing us. You're anti-Christian, you know something like that. And uh, you know we're, we're being they're attacking us. They're attacking our churches. It's just like it's sort of like they're attacking our churches. It was a piece of mail I got today from I think the ADF or it was the Family Research Council. And this is serves very well to sort of unify a base. It's, yes, it's sort of, there's there's a we under threat. You know, and there's a they that's threatening us, and I think that type of um, that type of thing happens with religious nationalism around the world. Well, and there is also, a, I think, a, a common thing or a and it commonality in the, 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 the yeah yeah a lot of the religious nationalism in the Middle East was built around its powerlessness and the feeling of powerlessness. And, and the the nationals came in and really played on that as a form of recruitment and we're certainly seeing that now with these religious nationalists too in the united states don't you think yeah yeah i mean obviously there are different features they're unique to different countries um, in different ways that it that it works you know it was really fascinating when i was at the world congress of families i heard a representative of the Hungarian government talk about all of the public benefits they were going to offer to people who had big families. And it was like the kind of stuff that like had, I don't know, any Democratic candidate for president, Bernie Sanders stood up and said, I'm going to make sure that no women who've had four more children ever have to pay tax again. People would have been like, well, that's, that's way too far, too far to the left. Now you've gone too far. But this is what they were promising. I mean, you can see why people, um, there's some right. people, they were just trying to encourage people to have a lot of Hungarian, the right people, right? Hungarians, you know, white Hungarians to have lots and lots of kids, you know, and they were like, you know, more than three kids, we'll buy you a car, we'll give you extra money for a bigger apartment. I mean, it's like kind of astonishing. So, and yet they have this like very, as you mentioned, very deeply authoritarian government now that has a kind of religious nationalist component to it. So um, there are features that are really different in different countries, but they all declare themselves hostile to um, plurality, um, I would say the notion of equality and um, sort of values of rational thinking of the enlightenment. Indeed. Well, it looks like uh, our time's about up and I think I'm gonna hand the baton off to to wear here. Uh, I should probably mention, uh, just to update my uh, credits, I worked for the previous six years for Southern Poverty Law Center and I'm now currently working for Daily Coast. So uh, if anybody wants to check my work, they can find it at Daily Coast. Thanks for that. So, I also should yeah. have mentioned that uh, we actually featured you just a couple of years ago, David. Yes. With your own book, Alt Right, uh, during uh, our Inside yes. Out time. but. David, uh, for tonight, David, uh, David, forthcoming book. It sounds amazing. It's about um, conspiracy uh, theories. Conspiracy theories. Yeah. Okay. But well, let's 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 stay in touch on that. All right. Definitely. So, so David, Catherine, I want to thank you both so much for tonight's program. Um, obviously, you only scratch the surface of this incredible. Um, 
of this timely and somewhat terrifying topic. So uh, if you are curious uh, to know more, as I'm sure those of you who have heard tonight's program will be, please uh, go to Third Place Books and pick up a copy of The Power of Worshippers. Uh, you won't regret it. There's a lot more to read. Um, I want to thank Candace, Josh, Ginny, and everybody else from Town Hall for making tonight's program possible. And I want to strongly urge you all to join us tomorrow night for our appearance by Robert Reich. It's the second time this season. I think it's his ninth time with Town Hall overall. Not even the COVID virus will keep him away from Town Hall Seattle, it seems. We're honored to have him come back. So uh, thank you, David. Thank you, Catherine. And thank you all for being in attendance with us tonight. We will see you again tomorrow night. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.